Hey church, happy Wednesday to you. Hope you're doing well. And today we're looking at Leviticus 22, 17 through 33. I'm going to start reading with verses 17 through 19. Let's jump in. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and all the people of Israel, and say to them, When any one of the house of Israel or of the sojourners in Israel presents a burnt offering as his offering for any of their vows or freewill offering that they offer to the Lord, if it is to be accepted for you, it shall be a male without blemish of the bulls or the sheep or the goats. All right, so verses 20 through 30, uh, I'm not going to read all of them, but it gives some examples of what blemishes uh, these things cannot have. And what we're going to see are two concepts here within this section. Um, the first one is free will offering. And the second is untainted worship. Okay, so first let's talk about the free will offering aspect of this. We see this in here, that they are to give a free will offering. This is what it says in the verses. So what does that mean, right? It means genuine worship cannot be forced, right? God doesn't want people to, to uh, be forced into doing or worshiping him because that's not true worship, right? So God wanted their hearts and their hands to be in coordination, uh, so you may be able to force someone's hand to worship, but you're not forcing their heart, right? And so that's what God that's what God desires. And this is why often God reminds them of this. He says, I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. Right? He reminds them of their story to say, listen, I saved you, right? You should worship me with your heart and with your hands. I redeemed you. Think back to your redemption, to your, um, when I freed you from bondage, right? Your heart should pour out to me. And so that's why he reminds them of these things, not just this forced, involuntary uh, worship. He wants something real and genuine. Um, so I think of my own kids. Um, when I, uh, I'll, I'll go to my kids and I'll say, hey, can, can dad have a hug? And, you know, they'll come over somewhat reluctant to me and give me some kind of lazy hug. And, and I'll take what I can get, right? But um, especially after they've been stuck in a house with me for so long, they're, I think they're sick and done with me. But when it comes to uh, those days, right, when they, they run up to me and they just come up to me and give me a big hug and they say, Dad, I love you. Now, my first thing I typically go is, well, what do you want? And when they go, nothing. I just want to tell you I love you. And that does happen sometimes. Um, I love that, right? Because I didn't I didn't ask them. I didn't have to beg them to come give dad a hug. I didn't force them to come give dad a hug. They did it voluntarily. And they wanted to, out of their heart, to come show me affection. And so I, I, I can't, I don't want to make them spend time with me. I don't want to make them want to be with me. I, I want them to want to love me and be with me and, and hug me, right? So, so God is saying something of this nature, right? God is saying, worship me, but remember why. I am the one who brought you out of bondage, out of slavery. Um, I freed you who were once held down from what you couldn't escape from, right? And so I want you to want to worship me. Um, so notice, again, the, the free will offering comes after they were freed. God didn't ask for a free will offering as they were in bondage, right? They were unable to do so. The free will offering comes after they're released from bondage. And I don't, I don't want to lose sight of kind of the order of events. He's not saying, give me a free will offering and I'll free you from bondage. Rather, God frees you from bondage and he goes, now with your free will, give me an offering. Uh, this is incredibly important because we see this kind of replicated in under the new covenant. So Israel was learning that true worship cannot be forced by the civil government. It can't be forced by priests. It can't be forced by parents. True worship comes from reflecting what God has done for us, his covenant, his work. So other than the worship being of our free will, we see that our worship cannot have a blemish. So this goes to our second point, untainted worship. Look at uh, verse 19 with me. He says, if it is to be accepted for you, it shall be a male without blemish of the bulls or the sheep or of the goats. So the offering is not just to be voluntarily, but it's also to be untainted. Now remember, the offering was to remind Israel of their sin, of their need for atonement, and that God provides these needs. He provides the sacrifice. So the sacrifice represented their worship. And if they had brought a blemished lamb, it represented tainted worship. So a blemished sacrifice represented an unpure sacrifice. So, so God is worthy not only of worship that is 
voluntary but, and, and genuine, but also one that's not tainted, one that is uh, without, with, with, with no blemish. So our worship can't be tainted by a desire than anything other than the exaltation of, of Christ. Um, he continues in verses 31 through 33. He says, So you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. And you shall not profane my holy name, that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. By bringing unauthorized worship to the Lord, right, they were profaning his holy name. Here they were to remember his holiness in their actions. They were to remember their sin and his coming atonement. But, but often, what we see, they would fail to remember God who rescued them. They would worship him just because they felt like they had to, or not, maybe it wasn't because of the, the social pressure to do so. Right? Especially in Israel where you have this camp and everyone's making sacrifices, everyone's doing it, and so there's this idea, well, I guess I got to go worship too. I guess it's 11 o'clock on, on a Sunday. I got to go do it. I got to go sing and listen to a guy talk. They weren't doing it because they wanted to. They would just give the sacrifice, not out of love for their God, but out of this, maybe, maybe it was a feeling of pressure. Maybe, maybe it was, um, it wasn't that it was like the genuineness, but maybe it was tainted in some way. Maybe um, what you have are people who say, I'm going to worship because I expect something back. Right? I'm, I'm going to go worship, but I got to learn something. I'm going to go worship and I'm, I'll give, but I expect God to make me richer. <laughs> right? I expect some sort of blessing from this. Right? They would give. And they would sacrifice. But what we see is that it was with a tainted heart. So before we kick it over to Will uh, for application on these verses, on, on what does genuine worship look like and how these verses of tainted worship apply to us, um, we're going to spend some time in prayer. You're going to see some prompts come up before you. And I just want you to take a moment and I want you to pray 15, 20 seconds for these things. As the church rally around together, even as we're in our homes, to rally around and to lift these things up. Take them to the, our Lord who sits on his throne of grace and invites us to come to him. So church, let us pray together now. Well, good evening, church. Thanks for tuning in tonight to our Wednesday sermon. Thank you, Pastor Jeremy, for explaining um, this second portion of Leviticus 22. I want to continue into that text and, and kind of an analyze and look at application tonight. Um, the Levitical offerings, the main idea here is that the Levitical offerings had to be offerings and sacrifices that were without blemish. And um, they had to be as perfect as possible. Now, um, we know that no animal was sufficient to, to really atone for sins. There was not an actual atonement that was happening. It was more um, a ritual that they were learning through. And God was teaching them about the, the punishment for their sins always resulted in the shedding of blood. And that without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness of sins. Of course, we know it was foreshadowed in Jesus Christ. And so as the people were learning that, uh, they, they were being taught that they needed a perfect sacrifice. And the reason we've titled this series 
unfinished business is because their sacrifices, even though they would find the best animals they had, the best sacrifices they had, uh, they were always going to be a little bit insufficient. And so that, that there was never an end to these sacrifices. It was always unfinished business until Jesus, of course, came and uh, laid his life down and finished the business the, in the perfect sacrifice. He was the perfect uh, offering to God to pay for our sins. And so no animal blood was lasting uh, for forever, but it was a requirement that their offerings be uh, as perfect as possible. Without blemish is the language of the Jews. Leviticus twenty two twenty one. It says, when uh, anyone offers a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering from the herd or from the flock, to be accepted, it must be perfect. There shall be no blemish in it. And so this perfection had to be offered up to God. Now, if uh, if you look into the New Covenant and what we offer to God, it can be an exhausting thing if, if we put this this yoke of perfection, this burden of perfection upon ourselves. Um, giving our best is what we're called to do, but but perfection just seems so hard for us, right? That that God has taught us in His Word that, that we are a people of grace, and, and even though we fail, we are loved and accepted into the kingdom. Now, we exist in a kingdom of paradise. That means that um, that that giving our best away is actually what's best for us. That that by giving things away, we are actually receiving the greatest blessings. And so God is teaching us something in this: is that full reliance on Him is what's best for us. And so we don't do this to earn favor. We don't offer up offerings and sacrifices and devotion to our God to earn favor with God. We do it because we have favor with God. And that's why a salvation message that is based on works is is a heresy. It, it's a complete fallacy and lie and has no biblical grounding. Um, the, The message of scripture is that you are saved by grace and that once you've received salvation, your heart is changed, your mind is changed. And so everything in you wants to run toward God's will for your life. And so we do work and and give offerings and sacrifice in our own lives for God's glory because he has saved us, not in an effort to earn his favor in some way. Think of it this way. Um, In a relationship, uh, if if you're dating someone, you are trying to earn their favor, right? You're trying to convince that person that you are... Uh, marriage material that you are a worthy spouse and you want to um, you want them to fall in love with you you want them to uh, you want to court them to show them that you are marriage material and then in an effort to eventually marry that person but once you're married um, our hope for marriage is that you're not just constantly trying to convince them that they should stay married to you uh, that, that at least shouldn't be the goal for our marriages but rather once you're in the marriage relationship you enjoy one another and you love one another not to gain them you've already gained them. Uh, but you do that out of out of just love in the relationship. And the picture of, of God with us is a picture of marriage, not of dating. That we're not trying to earn God's favor. God has made vows to us, and we've made vows to Him. That we are in covenant together, and we're married to one another. That we are called in Scripture the bride of Christ. And so nothing's going to remove us from this relationship. And so therefore that frees us up to actually live in this relationship in a beautiful way. Leviticus twenty two twenty nine speaks of these offerings as being thanksgiving. It says, When you sacrifice a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, you shall sacrifice it so that you may be accepted. And so it's it's not it's it's not just works based, it's it's a sacrifice of thanksgiving that because we are thankful we give sacrifices. And so let's jump into the New Testament. Given that we're not under the Levitical law anymore, um, what can we learn from Leviticus twenty two? What does it mean for us? Um, and, and given that we don't do these sacrifices today, what are we supposed to do to, to kind of express the same thanksgiving to God? Now, uh, one language that's kind of continual throughout the Old Testament is that when sacrifices were offered, they're described as being a fragrant offering. Like if you would burn incense and the smoke would rise up, that, that this is a fragrant offering to God, that, that the smell of it, the aroma of it was pleasing to God. And so I want to take you through four main offerings that we offer in the New Covenant that that are described in the New Testament as fragrant offerings or pleasing aromas to God or sacrifices to God. So what we see in the New Testament is that Levitical language is used to describe some things that we do in the New Covenant, even though we're free from the Levitical law. The first one is praise, that our praise is described as as a sacrifice. Um, and, And so praise can come in a lot of forms. 
Praise can be in song. I think that's the most common form of praise that we think of. Um, we think of singing to God. And, and so I know it can be a little bit awkward for uh, for us since we're not gathered to sing together in, in a church service and, and we're on our couch and you know maybe our kids or our, our families are around us and we don't want to sing along maybe sometimes with the video, but it's good for us to sing. And so, um, so sing as much as you can during this time, whether that's on the couch during, um, during our Sunday services or whether that's just in the kitchen or in the shower. But singing praises to God is a way to, to, to offer a sacrifice to God. Other, other ways of praising Him come through prayer, that, that when we pray, we ought to incorporate into our prayers time to praise Him. We acknowledge who He is, we thank Him, we, we tell Him that He is great and He is good. Um, also, our devotions, that, that, that when we are reading the Bible and, and meditating on His goodness, that, that praise comes from our lips. Hebrews 13, 15 um, uses this language. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. One of the songs we sing at New Heights says, has, the, has the lyric that, um, that praise will ever be on our lips. And, and so what, what's beautiful about that is that every opportunity we get, we want to offer up glory to God. And so um, in the Old Testament, not every animal of the flock was sacrificed in the temple. Like they would keep most of their animals. Um, they, would, they would only sacrifice a small portion of their animals. Now, what, what this implication means for us in the New Covenant is that not every single word is about Jesus, right? We can talk about the weather and we can talk about life and talk about sports or whatnot. Well, you're not really talking about sports right now. I think ping pong, table tennis is the only sport that's happening really. But um, not every word has to be about Jesus, um, but every word is allowed by Jesus, and there should be an acknowledgement of the Christian that even just our ability to speak and, and converse is a blessing from God. And so, um, so much of our conversation ought to be yielded to the fact that we, we use our words, we use our songs um, to, to praise Him. And so um, this doesn't mean that every song you, you listen to has to be like a K-Love song or anything like that. Um, I, I think God appreciates us just enjoying good music, um, even if it's not always about Jesus. But this does mean that occasionally we need to turn on some worship music and we need to sing his praises. Um, Hebrews thirteen sixteen tells us to not neglect to do good and to share what we have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And so this, um, this very next verse in Hebrews actually leads us into the second way that we can offer sacrifices to God in the new covenant, and that's through giving. Now, um, sharing that's mentioned in Hebrews 13 is an action of acknowledging your role, um, a kind of understanding your role in the grand scope of the universe, that God is the owner of all things. That, that you are not an owner of anything. You're actually a steward of the things that are in your possession. Um, one practical example of this is the house that I live in. Um, my family and I, we live in a house that is owned now by the church. And so we live in this parsonage. And, um, and so we have possession of it. We can furnish it and we can paint a wall a different color if we want. But ultimately, if you go to the look at the deed, it's not in our name. We are not the owners of it. And the Bible actually paints this picture that everything that you uh, quote unquote own is in fact actually owned by God because he has created all things. The Bible says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, which is my favorite redneck saying in the Bible. Uh, and it's the way of saying that God owns everything. Everything belongs to him. And so you're actually not an owner of anything that's in your possession. You're just a steward of those things. And the Bible calls us to be good stewards. And one of the ways that we are good stewards is by giving financially and through resources to um, God's mission. That we give as an act of worship, as an act of sacrifice. Although we're not slaughtering animals, we sacrifice by giving, um, giving out of our livelihood, which for us today, uh, oftentimes, the, the most practical way is just financially giving. Um, so during this time, I, I want to acknowledge that many of you are in hardship. And, um, and when you're in hardship, uh, I think it's a testing of our faith. But, but if you don't have income, God is not expecting you to give um, if you don't have income. And, and neither is your church. But, but I've seen many of you have started giving for the first time. And so just practically, church, I want to thank you for your faithfulness, that we're able to help families and do good um, and provide relief to even families that have been struggling because 
God's, uh, God's faithful have stepped up and said, we're going to sacrifice so that, so that needs can be met. The Bible paints the picture in the early church that they uh, had no, no one in need in the church. And I really wholeheartedly believe that that should be the case, that no one in our church should have to go without basic needs. And, and so we have, uh, we've, by God's grace, been able to do that. And the Bible actually uses the language of sacrifice and offerings um, as, as a way of describing financial gifts. Um, and so in, in God's way, uh, when, the, when the needs come, the means are there when God's people give. Uh, Philippians 4 uh, gives this account as Paul writes to the church at Philippi um, as they had financially given to missionaries, um, much like we do in today's times, um, to make sure that Paul could do the ministry that God had called him to. Uh, l- listen to what he says in Philippians 4. He says, You Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, Uh, When I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Now that I seek the gift, or I'm sorry, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Now, what I love about this passage is that Paul uses Levitical language to describe the financial gifts of Christians. He says that the money that they sent was a fragrant offering and a sacrifice that was acceptable and pleasing to God. And so, church, one thing that that I do is is just uh, on the Lord's Day, Sunday, uh, the day that we we worship together, um, that's when I have my financial gift to the church come out of my bank account. And I get an email every Sunday because I give on our mobile app, and I get an email telling me um, that that money has come out of my account. And I try to remind myself, and I try to pray, and I try to um, tell God that this is my offering, that it's a fragrant offering, and I'm giving so that the church can carry out her mission. And, And I can attest with what Paul said. That um, that we have have had our needs fulfilled. That our church has has been able to continue ministry. That we have been able to provide for people in need. And church, because you have given faithfully, that is a fragrant offering. So we want to acknowledge that as a New Testament sacrifice. The third one is our time. Uh, time again. It, uh, is, is one of those things I don't think every minute, every second has to be directly proportioned to talking about Jesus, but an appropriate amount of our minutes, hours, seconds should be. Um, our time is is what we are giving to God in devotion, uh, what we are giving to God in mission and other things, a church attendance, that we set aside time to properly acknowledge who God is. Um, and, and we set aside the right time too. We don't give God leftover time. Giving God our leftover time is like is like the Levitical worshippers bringing their least uh, marketable animal, um, the animal that they didn't want or was not useful to them. If they brought their leftovers to God, God would not be pleased with their offerings. And so similarly, we give not just time to God, but we give our best time to God. We give prioritized time to God. We set aside time for God. I mean, how many of us sometimes we, we might have the mindset, I'll go to church if I don't have something else going on that weekend. Or how many of us think, I'll pray uh, to God if, if I'm not too tired at the end of the day. Or I'll read my Bible if I get up early enough. You know, that should not be the case. Romans 12, 1 and 2 say this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. There's that Levitical language. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind, and that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This passage tells us, do not be conformed to the world. Do not conform to the world's calendar, the world's timetable, um, the world's time priorities. Rather, conform to God's time priorities, and that means that we yield a portion of our time to glorify Him and rightfully dedicate time to Him. and, and, And the fourth thing is this, mission. Um, the fourth sacrifice that we see clearly in the New Testament that we can sacrifice, that we can give, is mission. Um, what I mean by this is gospel leverage as an offering. I use the, the phrase gospel leverage a lot, church. Um, and the reason I use that is because God wants us to leverage all the platforms and stages of our life for His glory. So the the, the circle of 
of people that you know that you work with or the circle of people that uh, you associate through extracurricular activities, through sports or hobbies, or the, the circle in your, in your school, that, that if, you could, if you could somehow take everyone that's in our church and draw circles of influence of all the people they know, I mean, it would blow our minds to see how many people we as a church can interact with. And God wants us to use all of us as, as personal worshipers. He wants us to leverage all those relationships for the gospel's purposes, for his mission to draw people to himself. 2 Corinthians 2 um, uses, again, Levitical language to describe the mission of God. Um, it says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death and to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? That I love the language here that, that Paul's describing as people uh, turn from their sin and trust in Jesus. As people become Christians, when that happens, their conversion is a fragrant offering to God. And so when we lead people to Christ... We are giving a fragrant offering to Him. It's a beautiful picture. And if we're not doing our best in these areas, we are, we are just lazy worshipers. If we're, not, if we're not putting our effort into these areas of sacrifice, then we are not worshiping with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Israel got to a point after Leviticus that they had gotten very lazy in their worship. And, and they began to offer not the best animals, but they began to offer the animals that they didn't want anymore. They began to give God leftovers. And so as we come into quarantine, I would encourage you, um, and as you, as you are in quarantine, encourage you, don't let this be a time where you get lazy in your worship, but rather look for opportunities within this. Maybe people in your life are more open to the gospel than they were before. Maybe they're more willing to click on a video link that you can share and invite them to Sunday services. Or maybe they're more willing to spend some time talking to you on the phone. Leverage that for God's glory, and I promise you that he will be honored in your worship. Don't be lazy. Uh, look what, what happened to Israel in Malachi chapter 1, um, toward the end of the Old Testament. Um, it says, A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, How have we despised your name? And so they're saying, Lord, what have we do, done to offend you? And the Lord's going to answer them right here. And he says this, By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you have said, But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts. And so in Malachi, the Lord calls out Israel in their lazy worship, in their insufficient uh, secondhand sacrifices. And he, said, he challenges them. He says, Offer it to someone else and see if they're pleased with it. Offer it to your governor and offer it to your king and see if he's happy with your gift. And I think sometimes we can look at our own life and we can maybe look at our time and we could say, it, it, would, our, would our spouse be pleased with how we allocate our time? And if not, why do we think God would be pleased with it? Or we can look at, at our parental relationships. Would our parents be pleased with, with what we do with our lives? And if not, why do we think God would be pleased with it? Or, you know, are we, are we failing to prioritize the proper things? And if, if we're prioritizing work and play and school and, and, and our own pleasures above the Lord, then we're just misplacing our sacrifices. We're offering up secondhand things when God has told us that he requires our best. And what's best for us is to give our best to him. And so church, I would encourage you to do that this week. Uh, be blessed and worship him with all that you have.